in a sermon of series that we've gone through this month entitled, Do This in Remembrance of Me, we started off taking a look at the Eucharist, at the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. We noticed that in the Lord's Supper, it brings us all to a point of fellowship, where we all need to fellowship one to another. And what Jesus Christ did was he gave his body so that we might remember him. Then we took a trip to the garden, and we realized that in that garden, there was some agony and some sorrow that happened. And because he was the Messiah King, he was the anointed one in that garden. It made sense that he was in the garden with a bunch of olives because he, too, would have to be pressed and crushed just like an olive. The third Sunday, we went to the cross, and we noticed that we could learn something even from a criminal that the criminal recognized the person, the power, and the promise of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then Elder Bertrand took us through the process, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem where we bear palms and we recognize that Jesus the Christ went into Jerusalem. It should have been his coronation, but it ended up being his crucifixion. And now today, I'm going to take you all to the tomb. To the tomb. In your hearing, I want to read Luke chapter 24. I'll read verse 1 through 12, but for our time that we'll share together today, I want to focus on verses 6 through 8. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. It reads, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to be like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Verses 6 through 8, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. The tomb. I truly believe that tombs can talk. I know you're looking at me like something's wrong with you. You just started the sermon and you're saying that tombs can talk. I do believe that tombs have talked for centuries from the beginning of time. Through epitaphs on tombstones, they all talk. Epitaphs are merely inscriptions of words or phrases written in memory of someone that dies. The epitaphs give us a glimpse of life stories of the deceased. Merkel Monument said, though many people opt for descriptive inscriptions like wife, mother, daughter, brother, sister, or even biblical quotes on their tombstones, epitaphs have always been as unique as the people they memorialize. The epitaph of a famous bank robber, Jesse James, said, murdered by a traitor and coward whose name is not worthy 
to appear here. If you look at the epitaph of the tombstone of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you would see that it reads, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. William Shakespeare's epitaph reads, good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust and close here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. These tombs, they all talk loud. They're bold. They outlive the lives of the ones who are placed in the tomb. But there are some tombs even today that have gone unmarked, that have gone unaccounted for and unidentified. Some as such as Mozart and John Belushi. No tombstone, no epitaph, no mark, just a dead body laying in the grave. Although they left indelible marks in history, their tombstones, they still remain silent. But these famous folks weren't the first tombstone to go unmarked. At a graveside across a garden near Calvary, there was a man named Jesus. That tombstone went unmarked. His tombstone was not only unmarked and his tomb was borrowed. He had a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which should have been a coronation, but it led to his crucifixion. The visit to the garden should have been a calm from the calamity of the religious leaders and the government, but yet and still, it was his crushing. He was put in a borrowed grave, laid to rest, and merely a relic for the future. There was no home going service, there was no eulogist. There were no pre-need arrangements. There was no person to be able to help to put his funeral together. Angela's funeral home was not available to help to coordinate with the coroners. There was nobody to inspect his body. But yet and still, God always has a plan. God sent Joseph and Nicodemus to stand in the gaps to be that coroner, to be the ones that arranged his funeral. And there he laid in a borrowed tomb, and not even an epitaph, not a mere inscription of the tombstone was thought of to memorialize the Son of Man. But let me fill you in on something. In all of this, I discovered that God will still get the glory. In all of this, I discovered that even if there was not an epitaph for the Son of Man. There are still plates that are shifting on the earth from Asia, from Africa, Antarctica, from North America, from South America, that at the name of Jesus, the earth will still shift. The earth will still move, and at his feet, even the stones and the rocks will cry out and bow down. And if the stones can cry out, if the earth will shift, then somebody who has breath or to lift up their voices, raise their hands, and thank the Lord that he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is the Messiah King. He is the potentate. He is our Redeemer because he is risen, and he is risen indeed. Bless you, Kim. Bless you, Kim. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John, all four of the Gospels give grave detail, significant detail, about <clears throat> this resurrection story. Here, of course, we're in the book of Luke, where Luke walks us through the resurrection story from, from his angle, from his purview. And what we find here is that there's Mary and there's the other women that's standing in the gaps. And by the way, this is the last day of the month for Women's History Month. Women always find a way to stand in the gaps. When there's nobody available, a woman will show up and show out and do what they have to do to get things done. And so for all the women that are here, we celebrate you today for Women's History Month. Thank you for the women doing what you have to do day in and day out. But back, back to the sermon. See, I got distracted again. You see that? <laughs> Mary 
and the other women, they went to the tomb. And as the Bible records, it was very early in the morning, probably some time between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. This was a time to where, for those of us who grew up in church, we were getting ready for sunrise service. But it seemed to Mary and the women that sunrise service just couldn't come soon enough. Mary and the other women were sitting from afar, witnessing and waiting to get to the tomb on Sunday. It was a Sabbath. They didn't want to break any rules, so they waited. They went home. They tried to rest. Imagine the anxiety. Imagine the agony of wanting to go see Jesus, their Messiah, their Lord, for the last time to anoint his body. But they had to rest. They had to wait. And 4 a.m. finally came, and they made their way to the tomb. And they looked around, and they said, who is going to roll away the tomb for us, the stone for us? There's nobody around to roll away the stone. If I can use my sanctified imagination, of course, it was too early for anybody to be at work at that time. But I believe that even if it's 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., then somebody should have been managing the graveyard. But I'd imagine it was probably a brother or a sister on that shift, and they said, I'm not clocking in a minute early, and I'm not clocking out a minute late. My time is over. I've got to get home. So whoever's got to visit a loved one, then y'all just got to figure it out on yourself. There was no equipment to be able to move that stone. And they said, who will move away the stone? And they looked up, and they noticed that an angel moved away the stone. And the angel said, he ain't here. He's risen. He has risen indeed. Do you not remember what he told you? Do you not remember what he said while y'all was in Galilee? He said it on two separate occasions that he would have to die to the hands of bad men. And then on the third day that he would be risen again. He would rise up once more. And they said, we do remember. Interesting enough, they had a moment of nostalgia. It took them back to a place to where they longed for. It took them to a place where they felt loved. It took them to a place of sorrow. In the Greek, it's literally transliterated as, as sorrow, as grief, when you have nostalgia. It's the moment where you want to go back to that place that brought you the best comfort. And they thought about all the precious memories they had. Even in the midst of sorrow and agony, they said, I remember when he was on that cross. I remember the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. I remember the garden. Because this whole time, Mary and the other women were following him along his journey. And then they went to tell the other 11 and the 11 disciples to place their hope in Jesus again because he had risen. They didn't believe, but yet and still, it still brought nostalgia. It still took them back to a place to where they longed for. But it's something about sorrow that takes us to a place where we experience love because godly sorrow brings about repentance. When we think about how far God has brought us from. When we think about all the things that God has done for us, it takes us back to a moment of nostalgia where we know that the Lord loved us because of all the things that he has done. And when we look back over our lives, it should take us to a place of repentance because of his grace and mercy and all that he's done is why we are here. It is why we have our being. It is why we move. It is why we have all the resources we have. Repent and be saved. And thank the Lord for the moment of nostalgia. The tomb today should take us to a place where we once felt loved. The tomb should take us to this moment where we still feel loved. There should be an epitaph written in our hearts 
and we should think about the word of God and how strong and powerful it is and how it reaffirms that the Lord loves us. When we examine ourselves, when we take a look at the epitaphs of our heart, it should take us to John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The epitaphs of our hearts should take us to 1 John 4 and 10, that this is love, not that we loved him, but he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation, as an atonement, as a sacrifice for our sins. It should take us to the Apostles' Creed, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, that he was born of a virgin, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He died. He was crucified, and he buried, and he descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he will come back, and he will judge the living and the dead. And if that don't resonate with you, let the nostalgia take you back to your childhood. Yes, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Is there anybody in here that knows that the Lord loves them today? Is there anybody in here that knows that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? The tomb should take you to a place of love. I believe that the text today is giving us three friendly reminders of how we can reflect on the tomb to reaffirm the power of the resurrection. I believe that the first thing we need to do is remember the stone. There was a stone there that separated the women from anointing Jesus. When they found the place where Jesus was laid to rest, they found a stone and a tomb. According to the Gospel of Mark, it lets us in on the conversation they had amongst each other. Mary looked at Mary, Mary looked at Joanna, and Mary looked at the other women. They said, okay, who is going to roll away this tomb? We, we can't roll this away because Joseph, he rolled it in front of the door, and the guards, because of the government, they were scared that Jesus' body would be stolen, so they sealed it. What is we going to do? Who will roll away the stone? And we're all laughing. But let me suggest that we've all had who will moments in our life. And for the youth that's here, if you've never had a who will moment, trust and believe me, you live long enough, then who will is going to shake hands with you one day. You're going to be asking, who will? Who will make a way out of no way? Who's going to help me to pay these bills? Who's, who's going to help to heal my body? Who's going to help to get my kids through school? Who's going to help me to get a little gas money in the car? Who's going to make the possible happen for me? Who's going to do the impossible in my life? But every time we ask those questions, God stands in the gap and God said, I will. Is there anybody in here that has had one of those who will moments and God stepped in and said, I will. I'll step in the gaps. I will make a way out of no way. I will heal your body. I will make sure that you have enough money to last throughout the whole month. I will do what I said I would do because I said that I will take care of you. You are my children and I will do what I have to do to make it happen. If you believe in the who will moments, you should believe that God can do anything. Is there somebody in here that knows that God can do, do everything? He can do everything. He can do everything. When we have those who will moments, it should take us to a place that we say, what should we say then? If God be for us, then who can be against us? And if you believe that as God is for you and nobody is against you, then you should say, that I'm persuaded today. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, unequivocally, that God can do everything. That God can do everything because he is everything. He was before anything was. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, things that are present and things that are not even here yet, height nor depth, nor any created thing can separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the last time I checked, the stone was a created thing. So if the stone is a created thing, then God can move a stone. Is there somebody who needs some stones removed from your life? Is there somebody who needs some blockages removed from your life? Because there is nothing that can keep you away from God. So not only should we remember the stones, we should remember the shroud, like crowd, crowd, shroud. Mary and the other women, they entered the tomb. To their discovery, all they found was linen. The linen was used to wrap the body of Jesus. In the days of antiquity, this was called a shroud. In fact, there's a shroud today that's located in Turin, Italy. This shroud is allegedly the wrapping, the linen, the shroud that Joseph wrapped Jesus' body in. It's 14 feet in length, and supposedly, allegedly, it has not only the blood stains, but the face print of the Messiah King. Although shrouds are still common, there was something to be said about this shroud of Torn. It was something different. It was something that was set aside, something that is distinctive, something that takes us back to the tomb. Shrouds, they're white, symbolizes purity. Shrouds have no pockets because they believe that when you're dead, you shouldn't take anything with you. I know sometimes folks try to take all they have with them. Don't want to leave nothing behind for nobody. Amen. But this shroud has no pockets. But very unique about this shroud is that 1,800 years ago, Rabbi Gamaliel instituted the practice of burying all Jews in the same type of garments so there would be no distinction between the rich and the poor. There's something to be said about Jesus being buried and wrapped in a shroud. Jesus didn't have any Armani. He didn't have any Gucci. He didn't have any Joseph or Bold. He, he didn't have any linen suits. He didn't, have, he didn't have a super 200 wool suit. He had none of that. But Jesus the Christ, the Messiah King, was wrapped in linen made out of flaxseed. But Jesus probably said, if I use my sanctified imagination, I don't need that anyway. I won't be here too long in the first place. Because the last time I checked, this linen is for dead folks, and I'm not dead. I'm alive. Hallelujah. There's one day that all of us will shed these clothes that we have. We will shed these garbs. Yes, we have on our Sunday's best. Yes, we have on our Easter essentials. Yes, we have on our clothes for brunch. But guess what? All these clothes will fade away because for those of us who are in Christ, those of us who are in Christ will one day see Jesus Christ, and he will take away this old vessel. He will remove this old tent, and he will give us a new body, and this new body will be in the heavens with Jesus Christ. There's a shroud. For everybody. But one day we will meet Jesus Christ. Last but not least, we have to remember the shawl. Not Crenshaw, but the shawl like a scarf you put on your head. Right. I wrestle with that, so I'm like, let me make that disclaimer, you know, because everybody thinks Crenshaw. Sorry. Anyway. Mary and the other women inspected the tomb. After inspecting the tomb, they went to tell Peter. Peter, he went to inspect it for himself. Of course, we know Peter. He had to go and inspect it. But what I like about this text is that John and Luke both use this word, look. In John 20 and 5, the way that the word look is used is that he actually looked in the tomb. In John 20 and 6, it describes 
Peter as looking carefully. But then in John 28, 8, it said that he looked with intelligent comprehension. Then the other disciples, they came, they saw, and they believed. There was something in that tomb. There was the linen. There was the shawl, which essentially was the napkin that was folded that made them believe. There's a lot of philosophies out there. There's a lot of tales out there. There's a lot of commentators out there that say, well, there, the, what was so special about that napkin is that it was a relationship between a master and a servant. And during that time, if a master folded the napkin, that meant that they was going to come back. Amen. But then there's others that suggested the linen just looked too neat for somebody to wiggle themselves out. And so perhaps that something miraculous happened to where God took him out of that linen without moving it. But no matter what the case is, human logic cannot define what God can do. We always try to find a way to define what God can do, but because God is God for a reason. We will never understand God. We should continue to seek him, but we will never understand the fullness and grandeur of who God is because he is God and he is God alone. If we browse online, there are many that will say, well, Jesus really never died. He was still alive when they put him in the tomb. That's why he got up. There are others that say, you know, Mary and the other Mary and Joanna, they, they, they went to the wrong tomb. And then there are others that say, you know, there's somebody that stole them throughout the night. There, there was a gardener that went and, they, and, and hit him because they didn't want him to mess up his reputation. They didn't want anybody to speculate, and they, they moved him. But at the end of the day, what shall we say about the resurrection? When somebody asks us what we should say, what should we say about the resurrection? It reminds me of a story where Peter and Jesus had a conversation. Jesus said, hey, Peter, Cephas, Rock, I got a question. Who do other people say that I am? Well, Jesus, some people say, I'm John the Baptist. He's, you're John the Baptist. Some people say, well, Jesus, you're Elijah. Well, Jesus, you're Jeremiah. You are some other prophet. Well, Peter, who do you say that I am? You are Christ, the son of the living God. And when somebody asks you, who is this man that we know as the son of man? We should say that he is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. We should say that he is the truth and the life. We should say that he is the resurrection and the life. We should say that he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He was before anything was. When somebody asks us, who is he? He is our redeemer. When somebody asks you who he is, he is our Rosa Sharon. He is the way out of nowhere. He is the will in the middle of the will. He is our redeemer because he has risen and he has risen indeed. When we look at the cross, it should do something to us. When we see the cross, it should remind us that he died for our sins. But when we see the tomb, it should make us look at him and say that he rose again because he lives we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone. Because I know who holds my future. And life, I said life is worth the living just because he lives. Let's stand. God bless you.